let's talk through some of the basic relationships with gas laws. Things like the relationships between volume and pressure and pressure and temperature and generate the simple gas law equations we can use to solve most one variable problems. So just remembering that pressure is defined as a force over a unit area, which is why if you look at your tires, they are inflated to a certain number of PSI, pounds per square inch. Of course, pounds, weight, is a force, and square inch would be an inch times an inch, which is an area. We won't use PSI. We will use atmospheres, pascals, millimeters of mercury, or possibly tor. So knowing some of these conversion factors is very helpful. One atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury is 760 tor. One atmosphere is 1,001 pascals, or one atmosphere is 101.325 kilo pascals. Those are very useful ones to know because you will need to match your units one to another so that they can cancel out appropriately. Measuring gas pressures is done using manometers, either a closed one that measures the absolute pressure of the gas inside the bulb, or an open one, which compares the gas in the bulb to the room air pressure. Both of these have to do with the fact that the gas molecules are going to push down on the liquid in the manometer and push it up a certain amount from the force of the collisions of the gas molecules on the liquid. Now, if this is a closed manometer, I just know that the pressure is that amount of force pushing down on that unit area, and so I can figure out a height. That's why you notice one of those is called a millimeter of mercury, because it's a height in a manometer. If I'm dealing with a system which is open to the air, I'm looking at the fact that there's going to be pressure on both sides. There's pressure from the gas in the bulb pushing down over here, but there's pressure from the air pushing down on the open end. So what this tells me is that if this height is positive, then there must be more pressure pushing on this side with the bulb pushing this up. So I know that there's enough pressure in this bulb to overcome the atmospheric pressure pushing it down and enough to push it up this extra amount. So the pressure of the gas in an open manometer is the atmospheric pressure plus the height, which gives you an interesting thing to think about. What would it mean for the pressure if these heights were exactly the same? Boyle's law is the relationship between pressure and volume. And you can see this is an inverse relationship, but it's not linear if I just look at pressure and volume. If I want a linear relationship, which I generally do to do math, I can do pressure over the inverse volume. So pressure is directly proportional, proportional to one over the volume. They're inversely proportional to each other. That means that pressure times volume is equal to a constant, the slope of this line. And since the slope of the line is constant all the time, it means I can use this to generate a useful equation. P1V1 equals P2V2. This means I can solve for the pressure or the volume anywhere on this line as long as I know one point and, of course, one of the variables. Boyle does keep the amount and temperature constant because he's aware that both the amount of gas and the temperature of the gas are going to play into how much space it needs to take up and how much pressure it has. So it's really important to use this equation only when the only things that are changing are the pressure and the volume. The amount and temperature must be constant. Let's take a look at a quick problem here for Boyle's Law. 
I notice I've got a volume and a pressure where I start, and I am reducing the volume to, which sounds like the number two, 154 milliliters. So I write it. I identify all of my information. I have the pressure and the volume at my starting point. I have the volume I'm compressing to. I want the pressure here. I solve the equation so I know what I'm looking for. I plug it in using units, of course, so that I notice that milliliters on the top cancel milliliters on the bottom. And I get a number in kilopascals. And this is the way you should approach these problems. Identify where your variables are, identify the formula you need, write it, solve it, math it, always, always, always with units. So we can look at the relationship between volume and temperature as well. We can see here that a low temperature relates to a low volume. A high temperature gets me a higher volume which means that this is a directly proportional relationship. As the temperature goes up, the volume goes up. Now it's important, again, that we keep our variables constant. We are using a good seal to make sure that none of the gas is escaping. That way I know that this decrease in the volume isn't because gas is leaking out. Also, if I do this, say, open to the room, then I know the amount of pressure on the outside is going to be constant. So therefore, I'm only looking at a change which happens because of volume and temperature. Volume is directly proportional to the temperature, which gets me our useful equation here. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Of course, please keep in mind the temperatures have to be done in Kelvin. You cannot do this in Celsius temperatures. Kelvin temperatures are pegged to absolute zero. So to get to a Kelvin temperature, of course, that's the Celsius temperature plus 273.15. Looking at a problem with this one, I have a volume and a temperature, which I'm going to need to fix. I want a temperature after this has been compressed to 1.54 liters. So I'll write my equation, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Identify my variables here, V1 and T1. To get to a Kelvin temperature. I have a volume to I want a T2. So I write it, solve it, math it. By the way, when I am looking for a temperature in the denominator here, I can actually make my life a little simpler by taking the reciprocal of both sides of the fraction. Anytime we do the same thing to both sides of an equal sign, it remains equal to one another. So I solve it. I plug in the numbers using units to make sure that I am canceling liters with liters, and I get the Kelvin temperature, 219 K. If I want this in Celsius, then I would subtract 273.15 to get my final answer of negative 54 C. Amundsen's law, or some textbooks call this Guy-Lussac's law, looks at pressure and temperature. And again, it is directly proportional, so I get a similar looking equation than I had to Charles's law. P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. As the pressure goes up, the temperature will also go up. And the last one we'll look at is Avogadro's law, which is, of course, related to Avogadro's hypothesis. I want to look at volume compared to the number of moles. And again, if I want to just study volume and moles, I have to keep the other variables constant. That means the temperature will have to stay the same and the pressure will have to stay the same. When I do that, 
I find that this is a directly proportional relationship, which does make sense from our understanding of matter. More matter takes up more space at a constant temperature and pressure. So you'll notice this is an interesting little problem because it's looking at grams and not moles. So I could convert these both to moles, certainly. I could divide them both by 32 grams per mole, since it's oxygen gas, O2. But actually, do I even really need to? It really turns out that no, I don't. Because I will be dividing this 4.0 grams by 32. And I'll be dividing the total amount by 32. So I divide by 32 on the top, I divide by 32 on the bottom. And so those basically cancel each other out. Write it, solve it, math it and I get that the volume has expanded. When you're doing gas law problems, it's really important that you apply the does it make sense test to your answers. I know that volume and number of moles are constant. If I add gas, I should expect the volume to go up. In fact, I added almost twice as much gas, so I should expect the volume to be almost twice as big. And it is, it's 1.80 liters. This is a case where sometimes you can work your way through a multiple choice problem, especially, without having to do a lot of math if you think about what your answer should be. You can sometimes eliminate several different answers and be able to select a best one.